the central message, seek the things which are above where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. We can never forget that the central message of Christianity is the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus. The Apostle Paul made, um, uh, 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 was central. This part of the message was central in his writings. He went as far as saying that if Christ did not, uh, was not raised from the dead, then our faith is futile. That's how important the resurrection of Christ is. So it's not a side issue, it's a central tenet of our faith. If Christ did not rise from the dead, Paul said, then our faith is in vain. It's useless. We're not believing in anything. That's what distinguishes the message of Christ from any other religion in the world. And then that gives us hope that we too one day will rise with Christ. And Paul in the same uh, uh, chapter, this is 1 Corinthians chapter 15, uh, he says that, and if, if we don't have hope for the resurrection, then that is in vain too. And so let's do that. In Matthew 24, verse 6, Jesus, this is the, the end time speech of Jesus, all right? You know, it's, it's a famous Olivet Discourse, Matthew 24, 6. Uh, he says, you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. Many will come in my name and they'll say, I am the Christ. Nation will rise against nation. Are, are nations rising against nation? Are they? Yeah. Famines, right? Pestilences. He mentions pestilences. Bird flu, SARS, swine flu. We just had COVID, right? Basically pandemics, right? And then earthquakes. Do you hear earthquakes? Right? Uh, persecution, you'll be hated. Many false prophets. Love of money will grow cold. And then he says, just to cheer us up more, this is just the beginning. But now look at what he says. I'm just picking a verse because I'm not talking about this. But this is smack in the middle of this speech. And in verse 6 he says, you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. And then he says, see that you are not troubled. Now, just this sentence troubles me. Because Jesus, what you just told me, freaks me out. I am freaked out by everything that you said. And smack in the middle of it, right? You tell me, see that you are not troubled. And I'm saying, Jesus, this bothers me. This troubles me. It's unreasonable. You don't know what it's like, and, and that is obviously a false accusation. We're going to see how false that is, because uh, uh, this is his, one of the last speeches, right? And then he's going to go to the cross and die. So he knew exactly, this is personal for him, don't be troubled, right? Because he lived it. Jesus lived what he preached, right? See that you're troubled, and then it says, right, uh, uh, because these things... Uh, must, must, must come to pass. So it's an amazing statement. It's a troublesome statement. It's a bothersome statement. It is totally contrary to common sense. Because common sense says, you know, something bad like this happens, I need to freak out, right? I need to store up survival food and, and, and you know, uh, uh, what are they called? The uh, solar batteries, you know, and all that, and think about all that. And Jesus said, no, 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 no. Do not be troubled. Do not, do not freak out, right? And these things have to come to pass. Now, there are certain things, certain reasons why uh, that help us not to freak out. One of them is this. Don't confuse when Jesus said these things have to happen with... Uh, these, this is what God wants. None of this is what God wants. God does not want pestilence, wars, rumor of wars, and so on. Are you convinced of that? That's not what he wants, right? I'm going to just give you one quick scripture in passing. This is, this is from Hosea, right? Look at Hosea chapter 8, verse 4. Uh, God, the prophet is saying, People set up kings, this is the Lord talking in first person, he says, but it's not by, by me, it's not my will, I didn't choose them. Is that interesting? Huh? So things that happen that God doesn't want, right? 
And then he says, they made princes, but I don't acknowledge them. So there could be presidents and prime ministers and kings that have been chosen by people, but God says, they're not mine. I don't acknowledge them. Is that interesting? Do you see it there? You can't make these things up. It has to be there, right? And then, and then uh, so here's what we're going to do. Here is our conversation with Jesus. This was our introduction. Conversation with Jesus. I don't know what to say, but Jesus does. And I always go to Jesus for comfort, don't you? I cannot comfort you, but the Word of God can and the Holy Spirit can. Amen? So pick up from Matthew 24, okay? This is the Olivet Discourse. Jesus goes and has the Last Supper. And then John chapter 12 to chapter 17 are five chapters of the last words of Jesus, which I think every believer should memorize, right? He has the Last Supper. He repeats a lot of the uh, troublesome parts. You will be persecuted. You will be hated. You will be misunderstood. You will face trouble, right? So, obviously, we don't have time to read five chapters, but we're going to pick it up at John chapter 16, verse 1. Jesus said, I told you these things, all these things that he said, so that you will not abandon your faith or you will not give up. Because these things, right, you'll not be made to stumble or fall or give up your faith because some of these things, you know, the wars, the rumors of wars and the earthquakes and this, people start asking why and they say, and, and they could be tempted to give up their faith, right? You say, why, why would someone go to heaven prematurely, right? When they, when, 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 when uh, and you think, why God, right? And Jesus said, I'm telling you all these things and I'm warning you ahead of time and I'm explaining to them, them to you ahead of time because I don't want you to lose your faith, right? And then he drops bombs on them, and he says to them, I'm going away, John 13, 33. I am going away, right? I'm going to be with you a little while longer. And as I told the Jewish leaders, you will search for me, but you cannot come where I'm going. Now, and then, you know, wouldn't this agitate, you know, this agitated them. They got used to the presence of Jesus they had plans. They had hope. They had a future. They were told by Jesus that we're going to reign with him in, in, the, in, in the kingdom, of, they thought, of Israel. And so now, and they left everything to follow him. He said, follow me, and they did. They left everything. They dropped everything, all their, their business uh, their activities, the fishing, the tax collecting. Uh, Luke was a physician, right? They dropped everything to follow him, right? And he says, I'm going somewhere and you cannot go, but, but, but wait, this is like, you told us to follow you. Now you can't tell us, don't follow me. It's contradictory. He said, you told us to follow you. We left everything, we're following you. Now you're saying you're going somewhere and you can't, we can't follow you. That doesn't add up. The, Sometimes do things not add up for you? Right? Sometimes things don't add up for me, right? And then Peter, of course, obviously, right, is the only one that's brave enough, asks, where are you going? Right? Verse 36. Simon Peter asked, Lord, where are you going? And Jesus said, you cannot be with me now, but you will follow me later. So you can't be, so can you see they're trying to understand? Do you see that? Like you're going, told us to follow you, now we can't follow you, and you're going, but where are you going? And, 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 and I'm confused, and you can sense they're, they're, they're not happy. You can sense they're not happy, right? And, and you can sense the anxiety, the stress, the confusion rising in them. If you read, I can only read a few verses, but I read enough and I advise you to go and read the whole, everything that Jesus said. I'll just give you a few keys and then it will make even better sense, right? They got used to Jesus being with them. Letting go is not easy. Jesus has said, I'm going to go away. And they're saying, well, we don't want to let you go. 
Connecting was not easy, right? When your child from a baby grows up and they go to college and they get married, I mean, here's what you're going to see this morning is that we have, we have trouble, troubled emotions and joy at the same time. We're supposed to be troubled and joyful, and it's okay to be troubled and joyful, and it kind of feels schizophrenic. But it's okay. Everybody say, it's okay. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. Right? You have to stumble over words. It's okay. So isn't that how you feel when your child goes off to college, right? You say, well, I prepared you my whole life, but, you know, I want you home. I enjoyed you here at home, right? Or when they get married. I mean, I'm, I, have, I have wonderful sons-in-law. Uh, uh, um, Kevin married Debbie, and it's God's will, and Vadi married Laura, and it's God's will. But, and, and it was a bittersweet. The wedding was, did you experience that, your parents, right? You're happy, but you're troubled. You're happy, but you're bothered, right? And, and, you, and you're trying to mix the two things together, and it's not always the, the easiest thing to do. Letting go is not enough. And then Jesus said, where I am going, you cannot follow me. Now, but he says this, but you will follow me a little later. Now, here, here's the point. Pay attention. This is the Last Supper, right? Jesus died, rose again, right? And a, a few years later, when Peter died, he is with Jesus now. Are you listening? And when, and when uh, John died, uh, he is with Jesus. So Jesus went ahead to prepare a place. And then he says, right now you can't, but, but one day you will be with me. Right? So that has two, two flavors to it. One he prepared a place. We're going to read that in a minute. Jesus went ahead. These are the spiritual things, right? Set your mind on things above. As you believe for victory on earth, set your mind on things above. Right? Because the paradox for Christians is that death is victory anyways. It's the ultimate victory. Right? Now, that can lead to two ditches. Either, you know, you just want to run away and, and, and not do anything. And that's not what the, the Bible tells us to. Submit to God, so resist the devil. You have to fight. You have to believe. You have to stand. We have a moral obligation. If someone is sick, call the elders and pray for healing. Right? And so you stand and believe for victory. And that's the sermon that we'll continue with next week. But one day... All of us one day will not be healed and will not be delivered and we will go to heaven, right? It will work until that time. And the point, this is why Satan is so utterly defeated, is because the day when that happens and you want to believe God for victory continuously, it's, there's no sting in it and you win and you're a conqueror anyways. And if the worst that thing that the devil can do is kill you and it happens to be victory, well, praise God then. So they did, and so this has two flavors, is you, I'll prepare a place for you when, when you can be with me when you pass from this life to the other. And then it also has an eschatological application, end time application, that this is all in the new heavens and the new earth when Jesus will literally return on earth, which is future and has not happened yet. He's, he's talking about both of these things at the same time. So where is he going? When he, this is the Last Supper. When he was talking to them, where was he going? Well, he's going on the cross. You cannot go on the cross with me, right? I'm going to die. You cannot die with me, I mean, that day, right? And then he said, I'm going to go prepare a place for you. And you can't. But... You will one day. And so we're going we're gonna to read it right there. John 14, 2. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you so. And I go to prepare a place for you. Now that is absolutely unique, astounding. Hope because if Christ did not rise from the dead and we will not rise from the end in the end time, 
or we will not, when our body uh, ceases to function here on earth, right? If we just cease to exist, then we have no hope. But this is the great message of Christianity, is Jesus defeated Satan, hell, and the grave. You understand that the reason why we feel bad is because death is an enemy. Everybody say death is an enemy. Not, it's not your friend. It's an enemy. That's why it bugs us. It bothers us. That's why we don't want to die, because God made us to live, right? It's an enemy. But the great news is that when I pass from this life to the uh, life with Jesus, I continue to live. I don't die. Jesus said, you who believes in me will never die. So my body will cease to function, but I will continue to exist because death is the cessation of life. And you're, you're, you're never going to undergo that. You will always be alive. Right? So he says, I'm going to prepare a place for you. And this has two applications too, because the place that God is preparing is the church. You know that the whole church is a habitation of God. You know that? 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 5. You as living stones are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Right? Paul says, you're the temple of the living God. So you're the house of God. So the, the place that Jesus is building is the church as a whole. Do you get that? The mansion, the home, the place, the temple that God is building is his church as a whole. The church is made up of all the believers on earth and all the believers that are in heaven. So part of the mansion of God, the house of God is in heaven. Part of it is on earth, but we're connected because Jesus is the head, we're the body, and what is in heaven is connected to earth. So we're connected to one another, right? And so, but then watch what he said later in John chapter 14, verse 23. He says, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him, and we will make our home in him. Are you following? So this is where it gets, it gets, it gets, we have to really apply ourselves to get it. So Jesus went to prepare a place for us, and he's building the church, but also uh, the place is also you, is also me, is also the believer. You are the place of God too. Let me put the two verses together, okay? Verse 23 says, we will come to him and make our home with him. Everybody say Monet. That's home, okay? And then in verse 2 he says, In my Father's house are many, what? Homes. It's the same word. You see he's talking about the same thing? So he's building the church, but you are also a home. And, and, and if we believe in him and we walk in him, he comes and lives inside of me. We sang a couple of songs that talk about the presence of God. That is God's ultimate dream for every human being is, is, that, uh, is, that, is that every human being would be God's house, God's temple. To, can you imagine, it's an awesome thought to think that you carry the presence of the living God in you, in your body. You carry the presence of the living God, right? That's why if you want to go on a pilgrimage, you don't have to go to a sanctuary somewhere. Just go for a walk. You are the sanctuary of God. You are the temple of God. You carry the presence of God. Amen? Now, so that's the concept, right? And, and, and then... And then uh, Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. Right? So what happens, put it together, what happens when uh, a believer, the body ceases to exist? Well, you're the home of God. Your body is the home of God, right? Put, put these two verses together. So now, when, when your body ceases to exist, you need another home. 
And the other home is the one that Jesus prepared for you. Right? Because you continue to live and you continue to exist. Right? So, read again verse 3. John 14, 3. I go to prepare a place for you. I'm coming again and will take you to myself so that where I am, you will also be. So Jesus said, you can't come right now to them, right? But then he said, I'm going to go ahead of you, prepare a place for you. Now, aren't you glad that Jesus is in your future? Hope is tied for the future. If you have future, you have a hope. If you don't have a future, you don't have hope. And you're hopeless. So hope is tied for the future. So this has been tested and tried for millennia. Nothing to be afraid about. Jesus went ahead of us. He's in your future waiting for you. And when your body ceases to exist, he has ready for you a home not made with hands. All right? Let's read it. Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1. This will, be, this will be my main text on Thursday at the memorial service. Paul says, we know. Everybody say, we know. We know. Well, are you sure? Yeah, we know. Is there any doubt? No, there isn't. Yeah, we know that if our earthly tent that we live in is destroyed. Anybody know that one day our tent will be destroyed? Now, you need to walk in victory. You have to believe in God. I'm telling you again, any sickness that comes, you believe for healing. I have no choice. I have direct instructions from the head of the church. If anyone among you is sick, let him call for the elders of the church, anoint him with oil, pray over him, right, and the Lord will heal. I have, my instructions are not if God wants to, if he wants to. I don't know when he does or he doesn't. I don't know the future. My instruction is to pray for people and to believe for victory and to teach you overcoming and winning in life. Because whoever is born of God overcomes the world that says the victory, our faith. And I'll continue next week, but I'm teaching you to overcome right now too. Right? But that day when you will go to heaven, it will still be a victory. Right? Because Paul says, if my, when your earthly tent is destroyed, you have a building from God. There's that word, right? A home. He's preparing a home for you. Where do you go? Well, you have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, not built by human hands. Isn't that good? Now, see, it always works. I don't know what to say, but read the words of Jesus and you get uplifted. You can't help but being uplifted. Right? Thank God. Thank God. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you some direct quotes. Everybody say direct quotes. Direct quotes from Jesus. Are you ready for some direct quotes? Okay. Here's the first direct quote. Don't let your heart be troubled. Don't let your heart be troubled. He said that. That's a direct quote. Do not let your heart be troubled. Verse 27, John 14, 27. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives it do I give it to you. And then he says, let not your heart be troubled and neither let it be afraid. Don't be troubled. Don't be troubled. Don't be agitated. When you're troubled, you're agitated, right? You're no longer clear inside. You're, you're, you're not, you lost your serenity. You lost your peace, right? You're restless. You're confused. Restless. Distressed. Now, place it in context right, of what we know Jesus, when he finishes this speech, is about to face, and this is an unreasonable request. Because when he finishes the Last Supper, and he finishes, they're going to come, they're going to arrest him, they're going to try him, they're going to crucify him, and he's going to die. So it's, again, it's unexpected. See, it's the same word in Matthew 24. Where he says, don't let these things trouble you. And you want to say, no, 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 no. I am quite troubled about everything that you said, Jesus. Kind of bothers me. Right? And so, troubled. Now, everybody say troubled. We're in church, so I can talk about this, right? Do you know that the, that word troubled 
was Jesus' current state of mind. Thank you for your enthusiasm. Because you thought Jesus lived in a bubble and he didn't feel anything. Well, those are your thoughts and they're wrong. Because our thoughts have to be based on the word of God. I'll prove it to you. John eleven thirty three. 33. A few days earlier, he raised Lazarus. Look at what it says. When Jesus saw her weeping, that's Mary, right? And the Jews who came with her also reaping, he was deeply moved and troubled. Everybody say troubled. Jesus was troubled. These were a few days of him being troubled. Didn't live in a bubble, right? And it started, now you understand that the last great miracle that he did was the resurrection of Lazarus, and that is just a foretelling of his own resurrection, right? He's beginning to show that he has power over Satan, over death, over hell, and over the grave. So you see, when he tells us not to be troubled, he has a right to say it because he himself felt troubled right at that moment. And not only that, I'll tell you, there's three times, right? When in John 12, this is the speech, John 12, the same speech, right? He says, my soul is deeply troubled. Did, did you read that? We walk by faith, and we, we think that if we're troubled, we need to repent. Well, then Jesus needed to repent because he said he wasn't just troubled. He said, I'm deeply troubled. I'm really bothered by all of this. I'm deeply troubled. Is that amazing or what? Right? Why? Well, it, but, and then he says, you know, well, save me from this hour. So wasn't he troubled about what I just told you? He's going to be uh, arrested. He's going to be crucified. He's going to die. And none of that is fun. You're kind of a lunatic if you're not bothered by that. If you know you're going to go through something, you're not bothered by it. Like, you need help. And then, the third time that it's used, trouble, same, same, right in, in, that, in, that, in that same speech, right? That same period, that same moment, John 13, 21. Jesus, again, he was deeply troubled. Everybody say, deeply troubled. Have you ever been, been troubled? See, instead of saying, well, well, it's okay, we stand by, just say, that's okay, Jesus was too. <sighs> right? That, not just a little bit, deeply. So I, one time it's troubled, other times it's deeply troubled. And he explained why. I tell you the truth, one of you will betray me. So now he's bothered because someone is going to betray him. Well, I, I get that. You know, have you ever had someone betray you? Maybe your husband betray you. Did it bother you? Yeah, that Jesus was troubled too by betrayal. People in churches betray. I'm bothered by that. And, and you know, I used to feel guilty about that and say, no, I need to be a robot and just, you know, just, and, and no, 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 it's okay. I can, I can feel it. I'm okay. I'm not going to stay troubled. Right? But if you skip that, you're going to be schizophrenic. Right? And, and so, does he have a right to say to them, I'm telling you a lot of bothersome things, but don't be troubled. Did he have a right? Because he himself was in that state. Can we ever point the finger at him and say, you don't understand? Can we ever do that? Hence, Hebrews 4.15. This is the point of it all. We don't have a high priest incapable of sympathizing with our weakness of our trouble. That's the point, right? But one who has been tempted in every area, but without sin. So whenever something happens and you're bothered, he understands. He went through it. He gets it. And he knows how to help you handle it, how to overcome it, and how to get out of it. But if you do not pause to feel it, you will bury it, and it will come out in other unexpected ways that you, like, you know, you'll find yourself two weeks later yelling at your wife or your husband for you think no reason at all. Not good. So, yeah, I, I, I'm troubled. But at the same time, I, I also 
I'm not going to be troubled. <laughs> now try putting that together, right? Well, Connie said it perfectly. She quoted a scripture. She didn't give you the chapter and verse, which means this. We, we feel trouble, but not like the world. We grieve, but not like the world. What's the difference? Well, you know, in the world, uh, what they do when they feel trouble is they rip their hair out and they go on to say, there's no way out. There's nothing we can do about it. We're all going to die. We're all going to perish. It's the end, right? But we feel trouble, but then we always add, yeah, but you're going to see it in a minute. But in Christ, we win. But you start with, yeah, I feel it, right? Let not your heart be troubled, right? Continue now. And let's look at the next verse. The, the, keep on going. Give me the next slide. And then it says, neither let it be afraid. Now he's really beginning to agitate me, Jesus. He says, don't be troubled and don't be afraid, right? But I, I, again, this is unexpected, right? So he's crystal clear. Here's summing up what we've read so far. In the moments where we have the most trouble, and in the moments that seem the darkest, and in the moments where we're tempted to give up, Jesus makes it clear that uh, we should not be troubled and we should have peace in it. That you can be troubled and peace at the same time. Here's a, a second quote I want to give you. Believe in me. This is a direct quote. Everybody say, believe in me. So how do I not have trouble? How can I not be troubled? Well, I have to trust him, right? John 14, 1. Let not your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe in me. So the only way not to be troubled is to trust God. I trust God. I trust him that he feels my pain. I trust him that there are things happening, he gets it. That he doesn't want them to happen either. Right? But he said, but I have to trust him. And the trust, see, that area goes beyond my pay grade. How can there be things that happen that God doesn't want? Well, I, the only way out of that is to trust. I know that God is good. <laughs> Thank God I know that he doesn't want them to happen. One of the hardest things that I've ever had to do when I was young was to do uh, the, the funeral of, of a newborn baby. It was devastating. I'm going to start crying right now over that one. As a father, we went to the hospital. We believed. We prayed. It was an incubator. The baby died. We did the funeral, and you understand, I, I don't, it was just the grace of God that got me through it, that uh, the, the, the funeral, that funeral, this was the casket, this size. We didn't have a wheel, didn't the father, who walked by faith, thank God then they had more children, right? All that pain is erased. But he walked in with this, and I thought, dear God, so what comforts me is that I know that the trouble that I felt at that moment, Jesus felt it with me. It was him feeling it with me because he was saying, this is not the will of God. This is not the way that things are supposed to happen. Right? Well, why did they happen? I don't have the answer to that. My only answer is to trust God. I know he's good. I know he's God. And I can trust him. And I need to trust him. That's the only thing that I can do. Amen. Amen? So when I trust him, he has a good track record. We sang it, right? He's always been faithful. He's always been good. Right? So just trust him. And then if this hasn't bothered you by, by now, if I haven't bothered you by now, and I should have bothered you by now, but it's not me, it's Jesus. I'm just quoting him. So, so uh, uh, don't be troubled and trust me but now he ups it up a notch and goes into the inconceivable area. Here's a quote. Uh, you should rejoice. You should actually rejoice. Now you say, okay, Jesus, you've lost your marbles. I can barely keep up with you with, you know, with the peace part of the not be troubled. I can kind of work through that. But how can you ask me in my darkest moment to actually rejoice? Now, 
we'll go to the quote in a minute. In John 16, 6, Jesus recognized and John acknowledges that because I said these things, sorrow has filled your heart. So they were getting sad when Jesus spoke, obviously. But don't you like the Word of God? Look, isn't the Word of God real? Religiosity is not, it's artificial, it's made up, it's crazy. The Word is real. So Jesus says, yeah, and you know, I've been saying these things, but you've gotten sadder and sadder, right? Well, of course we got sad, right? Of course we got sad. You t- we had hopes, we have a future, you tell us we can't go, we can't follow you anymore, we're confused, we don't know what's going to happen. Of course we're sad, right? So they were sad. Have you ever been sad? Have you ever been disappointed? So we can identify, right? We can identify. So Jesus says, smack in the middle of all that, John 14, 28, He says, I'm going away and I'm coming back to you, but if you love me, you would rejoice. There's your quote. (laughs) So you would rejoice. So after rejoicing, you going away, after rejoicing, sad things, troublesome things, your betrayal, your trial, your death, your crucifixion, right? And you leaving, I have to rejoice, right? Again, would you agree that this is unexpected? And it's unreasonable. So, so here, here we go, having to learn how to uh, shuffle these two emotions. I'm troubled, but I rejoice. Uh, in the case of someone going to heaven, I, I miss them, yet I know they are with God. Right? So, you go back and forth. And then Jesus says in verse 7, I tell you the truth, it's to your advantage. It's better. It's better that I leave. See, that's it. What do you mean it's better than you? There's nothing better than being with Jesus here. Who's going to walk on water? Who's going to calm the storm? Who's going to feed the hungry people? Who's going to do all the signs and wonders that you do, right? It says, because if I don't go away, the Holy Spirit will not come. So see, he's introducing here the importance of the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit that is the comforter. I said to you, two things will comfort you. The words of Jesus and the Holy Spirit. And what happens is the Holy Spirit, in, in a way that is marvelous, in a way that he only knows how to do, in a way that we don't understand it, can in the midst of trouble come in and and just do something in your heart and give you a comfort and a peace that you don't rip your hair out and it's respectful and it's real and it's a mixture of the two together and I can't explain it and I don't have to explain it because we we live it, because you live it and you experience it. The last quote and then I'm finished. This is the last quote. Are you ready? I have overcome the world. Everybody say, Jesus has overcome the world. Well, now, now okay, I can handle this, right? Now, now I get it why I should not be troubled and I can rejoice and I have peace because Jesus overcame. In the same speech, right, Jesus said, John 16, these things I've spoken to you that in me you may have peace. Do you acknowledge that his words give peace? Right? His words give peace. And uh, then they say, in the world you will have trouble. <laughs> right? Is that a real scripture? But here's what's equally real. Be of good cheer. But I say, I have to rejoice. See? If I say, be of good cheer. Go well, like this. Woo! Woo! <laughs> see? So, yeah, you have trouble. See, it's the same. Do you see it? Rejoicing in trouble. Says because, I, but not because we're lunatics. See, not because we're lunatics, not because we ignore trouble, but there's a very real reason because he overcame the world, right? He overcame the world, right? He overcame the world. And then the last verse I'm reading, 1 Corinthians 15 57. Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus. And this is the passage that I started with quoting, we didn't read it, where he's talking about death. It's in this passage that he says, if Christ was not raised from the dead, then our whole faith is vain, is useless. Christianity is useless. And then he said, and if in the end, Paul says, you can read the whole chapter, we uh, will not, all bodies will not be raised from the dead, then our faith is useless too. 
But he says that, Paul also says, well, what about, because that's the end time, right? That's at the very end. What about when our tent is folded, when our body just ceases to exist? Well, here's what happens. God has prepared a home for you, not made with hands, where you continue to live. The thing about death not losing its sting and not having victory is that you will always be you, right? You, I, I am me. I am conscious. And when, I, when, I, when, when my body will cease to function, I won't lose a beat. I will continue to be conscious, but not in my body anymore. And Jesus is there. And don't think of him as being, you know, in outer space outside of the galaxy. The spirit world is right here. He's right, he's right here, right? And, and me goes from this to foom. In something that he prepared for me, you will not lose, you will be conscious. You'll say, we know this from people that, uh, you know, have, have passed and then, and that we know from scripture, first of all, right? That Paul says, absent from the body is what? Present with the Lord. So first of all, it's doctrine, it's scripture. <clears throat> but secondly, you don't miss a beat. You're not going to like, oh, I lost conscience, lose it. Your body, but you, you could, and in fact, you'll be surprised. You'll go, whoa, there are, but it says my body, go like that. And then, you, you know, the different thing. You, you'll feel, you'll be attracted to the light. And there, there seems to be that point <laughs> where, you know, God might say, I've met some people. We had them in church. Phenomenal testimony that said, no, you can't. You got to go back and tell this, right? Uh, or you just go permanently with Jesus. And then in the end, it doesn't end there, right? So you're conscious, you're you. And then in the end, and, and, uh, in the end, our bodies will be raised again. Isn't that good? That is what we believe in Christianity. Amen? And we believe that when we're troubled, it's okay to be troubled, right? But not like the world. And when we're troubled, you know, I go, I, I do this. I did it before I had to talk to, uh, to Ken, Marianne's husband. I went through these quotes. And I said, uh, and, then, and, then, and then I just told him what Jesus said. And he said, thank you, that helps me. Which puzzled me because I still felt lousy. <laughs> right? But the word helps. Amen. But apply it, apply it, not just apply it in anything. Anytime you're troubled about anything, right? Some suffering, some pain, a betrayal, a disappointment. Don't let your heart be troubled. Do not let it be afraid. Does that mean that you have a choice in this? Do not let it. So I can just let it or not let it. How, how don't I let it? You can't allow it. Because if you allow it, you slip into desperation. And that's, see, that's not, there is no desperation in God. Amen? And not only that, but you got to somehow, in between, you know, one wave of sadness and the other, you got to find the time to go, whoa, whoa. It's okay. Right? Because that's what Jesus said. And, and then you go, you go, right. And, 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 and the Holy Spirit does this wonderful work, only he can do it. And, uh, and you go through these. But in the end, what happens is you overcome. Right, you overcome. Be of good cheer because Jesus overcame. I'm done. And if he overcomes, I overcome.